Oscar Mayer. Now, uh, praise the Lord, I have a testimony. For by all rights, I should not be here. And uh, I'm going to try to make this quick and um, just run through it and just glorify the Lord. Uh, I'm going to start from the beginning, too. I was raised in a single family home by my mother. Our, my parents were separated my whole life. And I was actually, she worked six days a week. I was raised by three hippie sisters. Uh, <clears throat> And had really a good home. Everything was supplied where we ate well and all this kind of stuff. But I was a kid left alone a lot of times to his own devices, me and my younger brother. And uh, I think by fifth grade, realized I had dyslexia. What I was told I had this. And my mother did all she could to help me to learn how to read and stuck me in this special school and stuff like that. But for me, I, was, I felt different. And didn't... You know, something inside didn't feel right. All of a sudden, I'm different or whatever. That was fifth grade. By sixth grade, I was playing, I was 11, 12 years old, with pot, cigarettes, and skipping school. I think I, in sixth grade, I got caught skipping school like 34 days in a row before they caught me. So that was my heading in life because I decided if I wasn't going to do well in school, I'll be like my sister, hippie, hippie friends. I'll be cool, what I thought was cool or whatever. But, And uh, I spent a good part of my younger life, and I f hope nobody follows my trail, <clears throat> trying to please myself in any way I could find possible what the world had to offer, and that included a lot of drinking and drugging and adventures through life. And it worked for quite a while. I got by with that and uh, maintained. But as life went on and I got older and stuff, <clears throat> things started happening in life where you get a little older, realize there's going to be some responsibilities to face. And um, <clears throat> had a family member went to prison for life. We got all kind of little things going in, on in the family. And uh, had uh, my father died when uh, he was 62. I guess I was um, 25, maybe. And I was living with him. Mark. From the time my father died, a friend of mine found a bale of cocaine out in the ocean and brought it home. And um, all of a sudden, we had more than enough cocaine to do. And uh, with the situation there, father dying, just the whole thing, I was already actively drug user. I became a very active drug user and alcoholic. And um, <clears throat> unable, I always maintained a job because I liked to party and I liked make sure I had money for it, but then it got to where for that last couple of years of my life, I couldn't work no more. I couldn't get off the dope, and um, I lost all hope, and then everything I believed in, which was money, drugs, and good times, I lost all hope in that because there was no fun anymore. I was a hooked drug addict like these guys you see on television or whatever, and um, it was horrible. Totally lost all hope. Total moral degradation. I despised, completely despised myself. That I was complete failure and I was, I was gonna die. I bled out of all my body parts. I weighed up, I ended up weighing about 165 pounds from 200 normally. And um, <clears throat> I can remember, some of y'all heard me say this, but it's vivid in my mind. Somehow I ended up with a puppy. And I can remember walking by and I had to shield my face because I was so ashamed of myself, I couldn't look at my puppy because there was nothing left in me, you know, to even fo face my puppy dog. And uh, <clears throat> by God's grace, a friend called my mother and told her I was about to die. And she came out there and um, pleaded with me to go to detox. So I decided I'd go to detox so she wouldn't feel as guilty when I died. I didn't plan on going to get sober or anything. But I went to detox, and God had other plans. Uh, he sure did. <laughs> so uh, he uh, got me in there. Like I said, I didn't go to get sober. I snuck dope in detox. But uh, <clears throat> I got in there, and um, there was this woman. They called her mama. She was a big old black woman. And that lady showed me the love of Jesus. Uh, she took care of me, and uh, the first three days... <clears throat> I experienced him through her. And, um, I don't know.
don't know what happened. I came to believe. I offered my life to God the best I could one night laying in detox. And I don't know what I said or anything. I remember laying there crying out to him. And I woke up the next morning and realized I never had to drink or drug again and that there was hope for me. And uh, <clears throat> I could face tomorrow, you know, and my life totally changed, started to totally change. There was a lot of changing to come. And then actually this is what I kind of wanted to talk about. That was, that was, that's how God found me and chose to deliver me. But um, <clears throat> had a lot, a lot of work to do with me. And I remember, uh, now this was 32 years ago. Um, <clears throat> I wanted, I, I got home, got sober for a little while, a couple weeks, and wanted to go back and thank the people for giving me a new life and all this stuff. And I've totally been living in fear my whole life, hiding in a bag or a bottle. Had no way to know how to do this. This is a miracle right here. <laughs> Believe me, you all need to try it. So uh, <clears throat> this ain't the guy that I was. But um, <clears throat> so I went back to this detox. This is the first time. I'm t I want to talk about God's voice a little bit. First time I heard his voice other than I... I experienced him that day at detox, and two weeks later, I got my buddy. He just accepted the Lord a couple weeks before I did, and I said, you got to go with me, and we go to this meeting with AA. There's like 100 people in there, and I'm going to thank I just want to thank them. I'm going, and I was terrified to speak in front of a group of people, and you raise your hand, and they call on you or whatever, and uh, so I raised my, I'm praying, please, God, please, God, 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 please, let me. Let me, let me speak from my heart. I want to thank these people from my heart. And I, oh, please. please oh, oh, I get my hand up. They pick somebody else. Oh, 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 oh. I mean, I'm going with my buddy, Rick, Rick, I got to thank these people. And he's going, whoa. And I, oh, Father, Father, please help me, help me. And then, uh, like, three times, and finally they picked me. And then I, I don't know what I said. I stood up and started speaking. And my hands were in the air, and I'm yelling. And the whole room gets up yelling. And I fall back down in the seat, shaking. And I'm going, what did I say? What did I say? And my buddy goes, man, it was beautiful. You spoke from your heart. I'm going, oh, man, what did I say? And I don't know what I said. But God allowed me to speak that gratitude of my heart for giving life. I was given a life, a new life. So that was the first experience that I really realized that God listens to our heart. If our heart is to glorify him and honor him for what he's done for us, he will speak through us. And do things with us. <clears throat> so, life got interesting. God had to do a lot of things. I just, there's so many things I'd like to say, but we don't have time. But uh, I decided I was going to get involved in church. I was doing AA. It was 90 days sober. So, you're pretty green, right? I'm thinking about church, but my sponsor goes into prison. So, I'm going to go. I want to go in prison, too, because I, I belong there, legally. And uh, I thought I'd just help, help make amends by going in there and I didn't want to talk, but my sponsor went in there, and I wanted to just go there. So this is 90 days sober. I go to the prison, <coughs> waiting for him to come. He don't show up. So I'm getting out of here. But the lady comes out of the prison and says, you here for the meeting? I go, yeah. So I go in there by myself, and there's 50 men in there or whatever. And she, the woman goes, who are you, and what's your story? So I tell my story, which is a drunk drug story, and uh, for 20 minutes or whatever, and then they ask if the men have any questions, and this guy that you see in the movies, prison guys, big man, he jumps up, and he goes, you have a great testimony. He's mad. He's coming at me. He says, you got the nastiest mouth I ever heard in my life. And he came right at me like this, saying this, and this is God's house. I don't appreciate it one bit. And I start, well, I'm sorry. And then I'm blanking, blanking, blanking. Oh, I'm sorry, blank, blank. I, re I realized I was, did have the nastiest mouth. And I left that prison <clears throat> quickly. And uh, <laughs> I went out in that parking lot and just prayed to the Lord. And he delivered me from that that night. He scared it out of me or something. But, but the following week, I found myself in a church for the first time where all the good people are. And because uh, I was terrified of you all too, because you're all so good and I've been in the in the hole there. So uh <clears throat> fortunately I got he cleaned me up that much to get me there because I met this pastor at the door and I said, Hey, I'm Bill Carter. 
I believe in Jesus. I want to try church. And if I would have came before that, I would have had other words added in. So fortunately, he cleaned me up a little bit. But that was the event, at, uh, the start of it. <clears throat> and, uh, so God works pretty drastic. He has worked pretty directly in my life several times. Then I got married to that wonderful lady over there. Boy. <clears throat> You can ask her. I was terrified. Actually, I asked her to marry me, then I backed out. She was terrified. And then we did get married. I got depressed. I was dealing with depression, too, and all kind of neat stuff. And, uh, but she's, she's been very faithful and seen me through it and helped me. Helped, we've helped each other to walk through this thing, I think, it's 27 years. So praise the Lord for that. I mentioned last night the first time I heard the shofar was at Promise Keeper. I went with some guys to D.C. and heard that shofar. And a year later, I found myself in this Hebrew root stuff. It wasn't called that then. I don't know what it was called, if anything. But I saw about the feast that we were participating in. I didn't hear about the Feast of the Lord, but Christmas and all this stuff. And I'm pretty drastic. I ended up, I'm the biggest Scrooge you'll ever meet. Um few days before Christmas, I burnt the Christmas tree and uh, some other things, and um, it was a horrible Christmas, <laughs> I'm telling you. My wife and daughter are calling the pastor, please, he's freaking out, what's wrong with Bill? He's got, he's in a cold, he went on, and I wasn't in nothing, I just read a book, and didn't have nobody to support me, and I burned the Christmas tree down, and all this stuff, and uh, as the next year went on, trying to figure out what I was doing with that and trying to keep us married. Um, by the next Christmas, we decided, I said, we, you all can do the tree. You know, and uh, Christmas Day that year, this is how the Lord speaks to me, our house burnt down. It did. It burnt down Christmas Day the next year. I said, okay. All right. So we need to figure out something else about this Christmas thing. So We've been working that out ever since, and it's been an adventure. You know, we've got family, friends, and fires, so <laughs> you got to be careful. So uh, through this, now I've met, I, I have met some Hebrew Roots type people, but my wife, they don't get along. So this was kind of crazy, and, uh, but then fortunately, I met, after our house burned down, about a year later, later I met Tifa and her, and Randy. And um, by then, so now I'm here about Sabbath and stuff. So I, I have my own business, and I'm going, well, I'm going to keep Sabbath. I, I think I should keep Sabbath. I, I think I need to do this. And all my deliveries for my farm was on Saturdays or Sunday, but I always did Saturdays. And uh, <clears throat> so I see you, brother. I'm going over. <laughs> he does it. <laughs> Put another cassette in. Uh, oh, we don't have cassettes no more. <laughs> so, uh, where was I? So, I'm going to keep Sabbath, right? So, I tell my employee, I'm, gonna, we're, I'm not working Saturday. We'll deliver fish on Sunday. And he goes, no, Bill, we don't want to do that. We don't want them to get sick or anything. I was raising tropical fish. We need to get them in there. I go, no, I want to do Sabbath. I don't want you working for me. I'm going to do Sabbath. And he goes, no, Bill, I'll do it. Don't worry. Okay. All right. I'll let you do it. This is the first week I'm going to keep Sabbath. Okay. So I go in the office and do my bill, write it out, $666. Okay. I go, we're not doing, we're not delivering fish Saturday. So God, uh, you know, uh, McFly, um, me and him have a special relationship, and he needs to make things really plain for me. And then I still fall really short. But uh, that was the beginning of stuff like that and learning how to keep the Sabbath and falling short and God picking me up, me and my wife, and um, trying to figure this thing out, trying to figure out the salvation thing. And I'm supposed to seek him with fear and trembling. And now we got this Hebrew roots. Nobody's doing this. This is 20 years ago. And uh, I met a small crowd that was, fortunately, that helped support me through this. Uh, some of us are in here. But um, <clears throat> then I wanted to mention, like I mentioned, the promise keepers. Another way that God has spoke to me, uh, 
I got to mention this. Was, uh, I decided I met a couple at a bread and breakfast and decided they wanted to go pray for the nation in D.C. I deci we decided we wanted to go, me and my wife, and it um, was a year later. So we go to a prayer meeting right before we're going to go, and we're driving home, and I'm thinking, should I wear my blue top, these uh, gold tops, I mean? Maybe I'll wear one of those gold tops there. And then I'm th this is in my head. I'm thinking this driving down Howard Franklin Bridge. And I'm going, I wonder if I should wear Zeke suits. And then my phone vibrated right then at that moment. And I get it and look, and it's these little phones. So what is this? And I hand it to Linda. And she goes, thou shalt put fringes on the corners of your garments. I said, I almost wrecked the truck. Oh, my gosh, she's freaking out. She's jumping out of her seat. What? I'm, ah, ah, what? Oh, you, I'm calling Will. He sent it to me. Go, what are you saying to me this? What's this? And it was the exact moment it was in my head. Should I wear Z seats? And my phone starts vibrating. I'm going, I'm wearing Z seats. And that gold top to D.C. I guess I'm going to D.C. And then I mentioned it to Audrey. Audrey's going, I'm going to D.C. too. And Audrey got together with us and flew to D.C. And... We went up there, and then it was amazing what happened there. We run to the Capitol building, and I'm in this gold top with a shofar, and they, Bill, what do you got? Uh, I open the Bible, and I read uh, Hosea 14. And then I said, I'm going to blow the shofar. I blow the shofar, the cops start running at us <laughs> at the Capitol building. And I'm going, I'm going to read something else. I'm going to get some word out. I open the Bible again, and it's Joel 2.12. I read it. Okay, and then we decide, maybe we ought to go to the White House. So we go to the White House. There's a tent there. It's 24-hour worship thing. We go there, and there's a podium outside. And I go, what's that? What's that? And they said, they're reading the Bible. They've been reading it for 30 days or something. At the White House, I said, oh, I want to do that. I want to do that. I want to do that. You know, I want to just get in. Oh, I got to do that. I got to do that. So I go out there. And I'm waiting. And I go up, and the guy's there. And I said, what do I do? He said, just start reading here. I said, okay. Hosea chapter 8, put the trumpet to your lips. <laughs> I drove a couple thousand miles to go to D.C. to blow the shofar, and the Bible is open to Hosea chapter 8, and it says, put the trumpet to your lips. Okay. So that was amazing. And then the scripture with it was kind of scary that we read in front of the White House. I go tell my wife, oh, my gosh, the, 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 the thing said, put the trumpet to my lips. We just drove days to get here, and the Bible's open to that scripture, and uh, she goes, I want to read, I want to read, and she comes up and starts reading, it's Hosea 14, and I go, oh, that's the scripture we just read over there to the two witnesses, the White House and the Capitol, and then our, another girlfriend got up there and started reading, and it got to Joel 12, uh, 2, 12, and God had his word. I don't know what he's doing with that, and there's some good in that word and some bad stuff, but he, he wanted that proclaimed over D.C. and the Capitol that day. So it's amazing how he talks. He, he can talk to us like that. I wanted also, I know we're taking way too much time. I'm sorry. But with the Torah studies, how literal God can be, it needs to be for me, I guess, to have faith or something. One day we drove to the uh, East Coast to help somebody move, and, and we just did the tour portion about if you see your neighbor's donkey, you know, get him and help put it up. So I get home at 3 in the morning. I'm pulling a, a horse trailer is what I helped the guy move with. I'm driving down the road, and there's donkeys. At 3 in the morning, I go, oh, that's what I did. Oh. And I kind of stopped the truck. Oh. I don't want to go tell nobody about donkeys at 3 in the morning. I'm thinking of that scripture. I'm saying, Pff. <laughs> okay, um, 10 minutes over. I'm almost done. I'm thinking of that scripture, you got you to gotta help your neighbor eat the donkeys. But that's how, that was that day, that tour portion. And then I remember I put my truck in reverse back up, and I forgot I had the trailer. It smashed the side of my truck. And, uh, and then I go wake my neighbor up at 3 in the morning, and we're chasing donkeys out in the yard. But uh, <clears throat> God is literal, and not. And I, I love when he speaks to me. When I hear his voice, I wish it was every day, but it's not. But there's some, been some really wonderful things that keep encouraging you to keep coming back. You know what I mean? And then when he speaks to you, it's just so great. Just recently, with the tour portions again, Will goes, can you fill in for this guy? I'm going, okay, I guess so. And come up here and do the tour portion. 
And I get home, and it's the day of the tour portion. I go out on the dock there. I'm going to read a little bit. And I realize <coughs> it's my anniversary, 32 years being sober that day. And then the tour portion's about deliverance. And it was just, and it reminded me of when God, when I was born again. It was just things like that. It's just, just he's, what an awesome God we serve. And uh, what I want to say is because he lives, because that song, I can face tomorrow. And that's what this has all been, been about. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, most of my fear, fear is gone. Not all of it, but most of it. And he is faithful. He is so good. And we just need to praise his holy name and um, thank him. Thank <laughs> you. 